I'd love to invite to the stage two titans of the blockchain industry, Sergey Nazarov, the CEO and co-founder of Chainlink, and Sonny Kulachov, the founder of Aave Labs. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm truly thrilled to be joined by Astani here from Aave, who's uh, really been one of the pillars of the entire DeFi uh, community from really the very beginning. Um, I think all of you know Aave. I'm sure many of you use it. And uh, I'm a very big fan of it and uh, really thrilled that he's here with us to share, uh, to share his views and think about what's, what's coming next for our industry. So, Astani, thank you. Thanks for having me here, Sergey, and thanks for coming to, to London. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's a great place, beautiful place. Um, great, so I'm just gonna kind of jump in. Um, I mean, this week there's the Digital Assets Summit where there's a lot of capital markets activity, you know, more than we've usually seen in our industry. And so I just wanted to hear your views on um, what role you see Ave, Ave as playing in the traditional mark, capital markets, how you see it relating to those markets. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the way we think about um, decentralized finance is that um, it is a financial infrastructure um, and, and in the sense that we have a kind of like a longer, uh, bigger vision about at some day um, DeFi as it is as a financial infrastructure could, could be used by um, anyone and anyone has an access and it's, it has a um, global adoption as well. Um, Obviously, like we're all here, um, and some of you all, um, including me and Sergey, we've we've been here for a few years uh, in the space, and um, we are kind of like the early adopters of of, of the technology, but also the whole uh, ethos behind of uh, decentralized finance and and what it really means. Um, and I've been thinking quite a lot about this over the years because I started um, Ave and the predecessor uh, Ethland from from the perspective that I just wanted to build something. Um, something cool, something you know, better, um, something more interesting that is that that I have seen in traditional finance. Um, and in fact, like it's when I before building DeFi, I, I built decent amount of um, um, fintech applications, and and some of the things that really um, was annoying is that you know they aren't really. Um, they aren't really kind of like a, the, the the best that we could have. Like if if you have this technology where um, we can actually communicate across globally, um, and we can have global payment rails. Why finance is so difficult today, right? And why it can't be like one big borderless uh, market where um, everything is just based on best execution, best offers, uh, and, and, and trades, and, and provide like the, the best experience, right? So, and that's how kind of like a the, the Aave vision started, but over the years I've been thinking of like, well, now that we built something really cool and we have um, this whole space of decentralized finance and you know, we all enjoy the amazing uh, uh, yields that we, we get from, from DeFi, um, but the kind of like the next question is that how do we get the, other, you know, the mainstream people to use what we built? Um, and, and how do we get this, this kind of uh, um, adoption? And I do think, for for DeFi specifically, I, I think this, the, the 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 progression there will be that it starts as a technology, as as with early adopters, um, enthusiasts that really believe in you know borderless um, economy. We all travel all the time. We all uh, visit different cities and we do business across the globe. But the financial system isn't actually reflecting the way we create uh, financial re relationships or business relationship or even how we make. Um, friends and connections. So with um, DeFi, the way I see it is because it's been open source um, and most of these protocols are kind of like an open systems where anyone can come and contribute and build. Um, it reminds me that the similar kind of like a playbook of um, something like um, other bigger open source projects like Linux, for example, or database systems like MySQL um, or Postgres uh, as well. So the way I see the, the um, uh, adoption and, and traditional capital markets is that as the technology starts to prove itself and you know there is more time and more iterations of these existing protocols um, and it, we can as a community prove that um, protocols are, like Aave are resilient um, you know 
open platforms, transparent risk management, and all these kind of uh, interesting things that exist in DeFi and non-custodial access and, and so forth, as we can over the years prove that uh, it actually works better and it's a better way to, to make finance more efficient um, and equitable because everyone has the same access to information, that starts to slowly get more and more adoption. And I think that's where the uh, more of like traditional capital market participants will come um, and get more interested because now we have people who are participating in capital markets like Among Us, maybe even today here, um, brought here by the curiosity. But at some point, it becomes more than obvious that it's a, a better way to, to, do, to do finance uh, on chain. So I think we've, we were in a uh, phase where finance became part of online, um, and we're moving to a phase at some point where finance uh, is going to be um, part of on-chain and mainly done on-chain. On yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's very interesting. I think the, the, the thing that always fascinated me about DeFi, even in the early days, was it's a protocol that anyone can access uh, permissionlessly. And I think what you're saying is that as we prove the security, as we prove how it works, that capital markets will be one of these groups that eventually accesses it permissionlessly as a protocol. Because all of, all of these finance uh, systems have a lot of friction for you to access them. And it's also not predictable for me how they work. Yeah. And it's not predictable to me how solvent they are. And I think in working with the capital markets, they're actually very aware of this. They're very aware that they have counterparty risk that they can't evaluate. And that there's all kinds of weird conditions under which they can join a system, leave a system. But with Aave, it's this protocol. You can read everything in the protocol. You can read all the contracts. And you can come and go as, as, as you prefer. Um, and you can validate you know, where the data is from you know, yep. through Chainlink and so on. So I think there's so many things that you can know about Aave that just make it much more attractive than a traditional institution. I think right now for a small subset of people, like the people in this, in this room and, and other rooms like this, I think the fundamental value is definitely there. Where you can, you, I feel like you can know a lot more about Aave than you can about some traditional capital market system. Yeah. And yeah, does that and, make sense? And it's, it's really uh, fascinating because it's kind of like a really big paradigm shift. You know, it's like we're all the time sending like links of like transactions, like Etherscan links and, you know, mm. you know something interesting happened on, on chain. And it's, it's very kind of like um, a, a habit um, uh, or like a social behavior that is happening ongoing basis in our space. But you can't really do the same yeah. um, on more traditional markets and capital markets. And I, I think that's kind of like, um, I even think that the whole idea of, of open source it has been like an interesting way of, of getting DeFi and, and also the, some of these blockchain net networks to get adoption. Um, but I also feel like it's, it's kind of like uh, a little bit of like a tro Trojan horse in the sense that, you know, if we can build a system where everyone, you know, has the transparency and they can access to these markets and they have the same equal access to, to read the information and make their financial decisions based on that, that's just like a better definition of, of, of creating markets. So end of the day, uh, regardless if we're thinking about on-chain, online or you know, traditional ways of um, uh, exchanging value. Um, it's just about more of um, how we can make a better place to actually uh, do business uh, in, in that sense. And I think uh, on-chain is very good for that because you can create an execution environment where not just the, have the transparency, but also the rules apply to everyone, you know, the same way. So Icon, for example, right or anyone from our team can't go and just bend those rules that are on the smart contracts. And they just execute the way they, they have. And that's the beauty of the, the system. And I do think um, um, once we, we realize that how we can actually um, um, apply the same technology to these traditional assets, and that's where, for example, real world assets come into play, um, that will uh, gather a lot of attention because crypto and digital assets are, you know, it's still a niche and a lot of 
for example, funds or institutional uh, participants in markets, they, they, it's not really a, a category that they might be looking into. But as a form of technology, you can use the same technology neutrally and apply to any kind of uh, value that is so outside of, uh, outside of the blockchain and make it uh, on-chain verified, for example, with the proof of reserve uh, type of uh, uh, functionality and make it even programmable and create different kinds of uh, uh, layers that build utility on top. And I think that the, the, the really big value here is that we can also quantify the risk better. So if we are able to quantify the whole financial system from end to end as, as much as possible, um, we can build a more better risk management framework. Um, and on, on top of that, if risk is priced and managed accordingly, what happens is that um, you know, the cost of the capital and all the cost decreases there. So effectively, I, I think one way is that we, we get more of uh, traditional assets into the, onto the blockchain. And then we actually start seeing that because it's a better execution environment, you have lower costs, it's easier to actually quantify systemic risk. Um, that's something that we will basically see as a, as a benefit towards traditional um, paper-based uh, systems, for example. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think one of the things you said was, was really attractive, like when SVB was happening, I think you, um, you had situations where people that had certain positions with the bank or something could get their money out sooner than others. And other people might not even know that's happening. Yeah. But with Ave, everyone is on a similar playing field, regardless of their relationship with anyone else. And you know, everyone can see what's happening. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a huge improvement. And to that but, point, actually, what's uh, fascinating is that, you know, like that kind of like a issue can actually extend to quite far. For example, on uh, on chain, um, if you actually see some sort of activity, you can actually quite quickly you know, see that social behavior there as well. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, even if there is some sort of uh, information asymmetry or uh, there's some sort of uh, insider advantage, you can actually spot it quite Quickly. easier compared to a, a system where you don't have the same uh, visibility. I don't know who said this, but like basically, um, you know, um, like revolution can be achieved, like cannot be achieved in a quarterly basis, which basically means that like, if you want to build a future, you need real-time data, and that's basically how many of these blockchains um, operate. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, on the on the topic of stability and all these kinds of questions, you know, stable coins are are an interesting topic that also got a lot of attention during the SVB thing, and people I think started to wake up a little bit to the value of DeFi and these and these systems. So the the Go stablecoin, what what do you feel that can offer the same capital markets folks? this larger universe of, of users beyond crypto users. So how do you view, view its adoption and, and its value? Yeah, it's quite interesting because the Aave protocol started as, as a more of a liquidity protocol uh, where you draw um, cryptographic assets that other uh, suppliers are providing into the protocol. And, and Go is basically a one step further of, of actually the, the Aave being able to um, actually create a, uh, a bucket for the, the Aave protocol to mint an Aave native um, stable coin. And the idea there is that because um, you have this um, liquidity markets and, and there's the fluctuation between the rates, so most of the rates on the Aave protocol are pretty much variable, uh, meaning that it's based on supply and demand. And Go is something that brings the uh, uh, prediction of um, these uh, interest rates and, and at the same time um, creates this kind of like um, additional tool to, to, to quantify your, for example, borrowing costs um, and whatnot. So it, it's, a, it's a basically a tool for the borrowers. And, um, but what's, uh, what, what's the kind of like a bigger vision of, of, of Go is that obviously um, as a more of a decentralized DAO, the, the idea of, of uh, Go is to have a, a very decentralized alternative um, in, in the um, uh, stablecoin ecosystem. But at the same time, uh, we know that uh, down the line what will happen is that to get this space to grow and get DeFi to grow as well, um, it's going to be quite clear that some of the assets that are off-chain, they need to come on-chain. Um, 
And that's where also these real world assets come into play because um, we have to figure out how, how do we scale the existing finance and get it on chain. So from Go's perspective, that's one kind of like an angle where um, we'll see some sort of a institutional growth. And there's another interesting um, outside vision uh, to this more of a, a real world asset vision is the real world um, uh, utility. So I think there's still kind of like a, a asymmetry between um, being able to actually earn on a stable value um, globally. Um, and it's really hard to actually um, see it from, from the perspective that where we're living, for example, we have a stable currency um, in, in most of the Western um, countries, but there are parts of the world where actually you don't have the same opportunity. In fact, you don't have the opportunity to actually have access to uh, US dollar um, in any case. And what I think is fascinating about decentralized stable coins and, and with that stability is that uh, there is enormous opportunity for distribution um, and empowerment. And, and distribution means that anyone with a cell phone and internet connection could be in the reach of distribution of a stable asset and creating a local economy, uh, which I find like from a technological standpoint very uh, fascinating. But also uh, what stablecoins and DeFi can actually do is that they can provide the same yield opportunities um, that we have in some part of the world, uh, making it available to, to everyone in the stable value. And I think that's something that is really, um, um, I would say like underserved at the moment, um, but it's something that is really um, empowering. And there are times in DeFi uh, where the interest rates are quite low, people lose interest in DeFi uh, very quickly. It's very uh, rate driven. Um, behavior, but there's times like now where these rates are quite high and significant, significantly higher than uh, the traditional um, yield markets, and that creates additional kind of like excitement about um, opportunities of DeFi. And I think with real world assets, what's going to happen is that um, as more we're going to put more value on chain, it also means that. Um, these real world assets, people want to actually utilize the liquidity that is that is locked in these assets by being able to borrow against. And what that creates again is that uh, demand for on-chain stable coins. And I think that's kind of like a um, cycle that feeds it itself. So the more assets we get, uh, off-chain assets to, to onto the blockchain, the more there is actually need to unlock that capital and more demand for stable, um, stable coins and, and stable coin yield and eventually uh, creates a more bigger interest market that anyone can actually tap into. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, I hope that wasn't too complex because that sounded really complex. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it makes, I think it makes perfect sense. I think um, real world assets coming in, in my opinion, will create a real diversity of collateral. I think that's been one of the really big um, issues in the, in the DeFi world that have been led to certain failures where the collateral is always so crypto heavy. And if you have more real world assets coming in, I think you have a greater diversity of the collateral that's affected by a crypto boom or bust or some other problem in the, in the world. And I think that that collateral being diversified will actually create more stability generally across you know, various protocols, lending protocols, stable coins and so on. I would be curious to also hear, Sergey, from kind of like a, your point of view, what, um, what, do, what would you say would be the chain link's ro role in this kind of like a bridge between um, traditional finance, mm -hmm. real world assets and, um, and DeFi? Sure, so I, I think all of uh, DeFi, the Web3 world, is the place where a lot of the initial design patterns have emerged. And I think that's the place where the most advanced versions of things will continue to come from because it has the least amount of limitation. But at the same time, you have literally hundreds of trillions of dollars in value in a traditional system that people are comfortable with. And somehow you have to get both of these worlds to interface. So really you wanna create a single world, right? You wanna create a single interconnected world where 
you just have one, what we call internet of contracts, right? So there, mm -hmm. there isn't like a bank internet and an insurance internet and a gaming internet. There's like one internet, right? We're all on one internet together with all the banks and all the gaming companies and all the insurance companies and so on. So fu fundamentally what, what I think you're trying to do when you create a data transmission layer and a value transmission layer like Chainlink is you're trying to create a single internet of contracts because all of the data and all of the value can flow freely between DeFi applications, capital markets chains, and everywhere, right? So right now it's still these two parallel worlds that are developing separately and in parallel to each other. But I think they're fundamentally involved in the same activity. They're fundamentally uh, doing the same exact economic activity just with different groups of people and slightly different legal requirements. And as the legal requirements become clearer, I think they will converge into one group of people, basically. And the way that looks practically for something like Aave is capital markets users that have their value on a, a Bank of America chain or a Goldman Sachs chain or Lloyd's of London or whatever, just whatever the bank chain is, they will want to use Aave. Oh, bank chain. <laughs> yeah, because, because it's just easier and easier to get a chain, right? Like it's becoming easier and easier to launch an L2 or your own chain or something. So they're all just going to have their own chains. And then they're going to, I think, want to use Aave. And then the question is, how do they rely on Aave? How do they know the security of Aave is there? And I think that's uh, something that Chainlink has played a big role in, in helping generate that security. And then there's the question of how do I connect to Aave from all of these different bank chain environments. Um, I think that's kind of the next challenge to solve on an infrastructure level from my point of view. And then Aave, I think, will remain a really attractive place to put capital and value, um, including these real world assets, right? Which will, which will actually yeah. make it a more stable place. And uh, do you think, um, maybe the, 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 the question also here is that, um, We've, uh, I mean, we've, the, the space has been growing quite, um, quite a lot. And I, I would some, some ways argue that obviously DeFi is relatively small uh, at the moment. So we're, I think we, we, we were reaching 100 billion um, recently and um, in terms of the total locked value, which is a kind of like a meme metric of, of measuring the on-chain um, AUM. Well, my kind of question is that as the stakes are um, growing on an ongoing basis, so let's say that if we're going to see, um, who knows, like one trillion worth of value uh, in, in DeFi, let's say, in a year, just don't quote me, but like, <laughs> let's, say, let's say that will be the case. Um, what's the kind of like a unique value proposition uh, from Chainlink point of view? Because I think like decentralized Oracle networks are a little bit of mystery. Um, especially for the newcomers uh, to understand, obviously, how, how they function and, 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 and basically how they secure. But maybe because you're here today, um, it will be interesting to know, like, what is uh, Chainlink kind of like a uniqueness towards the, the, the security and, and how do you think about it as the stake in DeFi is, is growing in terms of uh, value that is uh, in the ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. So I, I think Oracle networks generally should scale their security to what they secure. So as the value secured continues to grow, I think you'll end up seeing maybe higher quality nodes, nodes with better performance, more nodes, um, you know, a number of other guarantees about maybe the technology that the nodes use. So the, the difference between Oracle networks and blockchains is blockchains are a single chain that generates basically blocks of transactions in a single place. But Oracle networks, there's literally thousands of Oracle networks, right? Thousands of individual chain link networks that generate different pieces of data. And as that piece of data or as that connection starts to be related to more value, the scale of that should increase, right? The scale of that security should go in lockstep with the value in some form. And the quality of the nodes, I think right now the networks are Having a lot of nodes, generally, there's probably an overemphasis on the amount of security, which is the right thing to do. But if we start reaching the trillion dollar level, the other level, I think that the amount of security should increase. 
Um, and likewise, then the fees for the security might also have a different dynamic around what, what they need to be. But at the end of the day, Chainlink is really made to scale its security relative to the value it secures over time. And I think that's also the thing that makes it attractive for, for the capital markets, because the capital markets are going to need to look at a system, and they're not going to just need to evaluate your smart contract code. They'll definitely evaluate that, and they'll definitely be happy to understand and see how transparent and clear everything is within the Aave protocol. But they'll also need to see the other systems connected to Aave and that they're providing the necessary security. So the real goal of the system is to reach this high level of security guarantees. And that's basically part of the Oracle design, because um, it's, it's really a complex field. What I've, um, I mean, just for kind of like a background um, details, I think we, we created our like own little Oracle back in 2017. Um, and, and I kind of like remember that half of our team's work went to just maintaining this Oracle and um, trying to uh, basically get it into a shape that it's functional and it, it works well. So for, for, um, for teams and like protocols like Aave, it definitely kind of like solves one really important piece of component. And I think it's really underestimated like how hard this Oracle field is because the prices and price movements are really dynamic. Um, so obviously asset valuations, they can go extremely high or low depending on you know, some unexpected um, uh, movements um, or events. And designing a good Oracle that basically ensures that that doesn't create an anomaly or let's say some sort of like um, unexpected liquidations is uh, it kind of like feels um, very like a difficult uh, challenge to, 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 to solve. And I think that's where Chainlink has been um, quite, quite successful uh, so far. Switching a little bit gears. Um, so uh, we both started when, you know, Ethereum was pretty much the only network where um, people were building. Obviously there was other types of uh, blockchains, but like, um, an interesting question is that now that we we start seeing this kind of like a multiverse or how do you how do you multi mention chain. yeah multi chain but also like what you mentioned of uh, internet of contracts yeah. and these different um, networks and the question is that what's what kind of approach Chainlink is taking in this uh, cross chain multi chain uh, world and and also maybe I would like to ask like how many networks you think there's going to be. And that's something that probably everyone has a, has a question in their mind that are we going to see that there's going to be maybe um, 20 um, roll-ups, uh, L2s, or are we going to see like hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands? And um, I don't know, I, I would really want to get you to choose a number on, on that question. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll choose a number. I think it's going to be probably, do you mean like instances or individual technologies? Basically what people call like networks. Um, so okay, uh, I, th I think there'll be thousands. Thousands, yeah. I, I, th I think there'll be thousands. Um, I think the thing with blockchain technology was before people were trying to scale it to create a single network, a singleton, and they were saying everyone's gonna go in this single thing and we're gonna get native composability and that's how we're gonna achieve a lot of goals. And that story kind of changed a few years ago to it's good to make replicas, right? It's good to replicate mm -hmm. um, what a blockchain does across multiple instances and basically do load balancing. And that's kind of how L2s have, have come to emerge as the preferred approach because scaling a single instance isn't something that, you know, seems very achievable. So I think if that's the direction of let's make a ton of replicas and that's the effort that everyone is now involved in is how to more efficiently make replicas of blockchains, yeah, you're going to have thousands of, of, of different L2s. There's also a very big incentive because the ability to make money by making a blockchain, making a token, getting VCs to get the token, flipping the token, making some more money, making then the VCs take a portion of that, they do it again, right? So as long as that dynamic continues to mm. exist, the, abil the incentive to create more blockchain technologies will exist. And what all of this does really is it creates a large amount of fragmentation about the technology and that technology fragmentation creates a fragmentation of liquidity, right? Of all the value that people can use to buy real world assets where they, or where they could generate real world assets on all these different chains. And that fragmentation, I think, creates a big, a big limiting factor, right? Because 
even if I make a great real world asset and I make it on my own chain, but it's not connected to all the other chains where someone can buy it from, then my market's relatively limited. And so this is the, the real problem CCIP is seeking to solve. Mm -hmm. And the way it's seeking to solve it is similar to you know, the dynamics you described with the complexity of Oracle networks. Oracle networks kind of solve this long-standing problem of, I have a single Oracle, but the single Oracle can't be relied upon to control too much value, right? So Oracle networks mm -hmm. were invented by Chainlink and came about to move data into uh, blockchains. But really the cross-chain problem is also the movement of data because the movement of tokens is basically data just moving across chains. Mm -hmm. And so the same security model that moved data into chains can absolutely move data across chains. Mm -hmm. And because of all the value that the Chainlink kind of model and the Chainlink decentralized Oracle network security model has enabled, and so far CCIP has been enabling securely, I think that it'll really just come back to uh, the security, right? Because what, what yeah. you don't want is you don't want to connect your DeFi protocol to an insecure data feed that'll then corrupt it and have value lost. You don't want to connect your um, network, your, your DeFi protocol to another blockchain network. And then in that connection, you lose value, right? And this is something that's not, I think, super duper fully understood yet by capital markets. Yeah but they have security teams that are actually gonna have very stringent requirements for both the data and the cross chain. So our fundamental approach is the same as always. It's basically generating security for these critical interactions so that as the critical interactions happen between data or between different blockchains, you don't experience risk and you don't experience loss. And then the next question is kind of how much more data can you put into something like a real world asset? Mm. Um, but I'm actually very eager to hear your views about how you see real world assets going on to you know, define the DeFi industry and how you see them interacting with, uh, with all of it. Yeah, speaking of like CCIP, like, I didn't wanna come and brag, but, uh, but we, we did make our first um, test transaction from Ethereum Sepolia um, to um, Arbitrum Sepolia uh, through Chainlink CCIP, um, so that's, pretty much done. So our kind of like uh, understanding is that there's going to be um, uh, obviously like an Aave copy pretty much on a network where you will have to have some sort of a liquidity layer. And I, I, I think a lot of these networks that start in the beginning, they have one type of a utility um, that they're, they're planning. You, you have more general purpose, um, let's say I'll choose like Optimism and um, Arbitrum, but uh, quite quickly that these newer networks that Altus we, we, we're gonna see, they have one special purpose. And it always starts like that, um, um, but quite quickly, these networks realize that they really need liquidity. So if, if, if blockchain is kind of like an asset um, creation or tokenization machine, um, that also means that financial market will um, exist there whether, um, uh, if, if there's some sort of a value there. And, and softwares like the Aave protocol um, or the Chainlink oracles, these are the things that basically exist and have to exist in every uh, place of this blockchain world where there is some sort of a need for financial layer, one way um, or another. And obviously, like some of the things that we've uh, we've been more concerned is that um, I mean, Aave protocol has been in twelve; it's now in twelve different networks um, at the moment. So. And we have more deployments um, coming in, and and it's it's not a secret that we're looking also into non EVM networks and and, and building uh, a version of of, of Orbit in, in in those um, places. But for example, for us, what's interesting is that in some of these networks, um, the Aave DAO, uh, for example, can't move quickly enough or doesn't want to move quickly enough to to deploy um, a version of a protocol, um, and there's different kinds of security concerns related to that and due diligence uh, before network deployment. So we see kind of uh, forks going um, before the actual like official deployments. And one of the concerns we have is that um, many of these uh, teams that fork the other protocol, they don't really kind of um, um, know necessarily the code base properly, um, or we get a feel from their questions that, um, they're not really um, 
uh, professionals in terms of uh, security or even great developer uh, practices. So sometimes it's kind of like um, uh, we get a feeling that there's like um, someone who is wants to fly like a plane without the actual kind of like uh, experience. So that's kind of like a, one of the things that we think about when it comes to um, security and risk and, and all these networks. So I do think that overall, um, a lot of these networks, they will have liquidity layers, uh, but some of these networks, either they're built on top of the L2s or uh, they have some sort of a way of actually um, borrowing the financial layer from another network and, and having that kind of like a, um, uh, messaging between, um, between where there's actual liquidity and where you can trade and, and another network. So I think this is where CCIP is, is fascinating because you could actually, uh, with CCIP, you could trade in another network uh, and do financial transactions without actually moving all that capital into that, uh, that network where you don't necessarily want to have a new version of Aave uh, as an example. I find it really uh, uh, fascinating. And I do believe that uh, the same kind of like a bet that there's going to be probably like thousands of blockchain networks and um, and they will have, many of them will have a, a copy of um, Aave protocol. They will have uh, Chainlink oracles and, um, and, and CCIP in, in between. Um, I, I also think about kind of like a sim in similar way. And I, I think that a lot of this networking is going to be abstracted away from the users. So all this thing about like, you know, switching networks in, in MetaMask and all that bullshit will, I think that will disappear. <laughs> quite quickly, but also from developers' perspective that you know, a lot of that networking will go away. And I think that's how it should be. Like when you are uh, you know, pinging the internet and you are sending and receiving data, um, you don't have to like, go from one place to another um, in terms of like, the data transfer. Like the, the way I see the blockchains work today, it's kind of like, um, I don't know if I was not living in during that time, but I've seen pictures of uh, uh, telephone uh, exchanges where there was people working and, and switching, you know, all these connections, and that's how the blockchain is basically built today. Well, guess what? Today we, we basically are using, you know, phones, making calls, using different networks, uh, telecommunication networks, without actually realizing that there's some sort of a switch in the network. And obviously that's all based on trust, but the blockchain version of, of this future is uh, trustless, verified, and, and that's that's the, um, that's the future, I would say, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. That's actually a great analogy. Don't be surprised if I, if you see, <laughs> if you see a video somewhere of me explaining it that way. <laughs> but that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think we only have time for maybe one or two more questions. So one, one of the things that I just wanted to get a sense of was how you see all of this evolving, right? So we see the capital markets doing more blockchain things. Mm. We see DeFi growing now also as the crypto markets grow. How do you see, you know, I, I briefly described the internet of contracts and all these types of things. So how do you see things eventually evolving between DeFi and the capital markets and kind of how do these two parallel worlds evolve? How does that all work out over the, you know, medium to long term, let's say the next uh, five to 10 years, something like that? Yeah, I, I think fi financial markets uh, in general, they, they move very slowly. So, so, so the way I... Um, just observing uh, the, the the progress of DeFi, um, and you know we, we have more and more users uh, coming in. You know we've we quantify that we have over a million addresses interacting with all these different deployments of our protocol, um, mm -hmm. and that's also an outdated number. It's much more these days. Um, but in general, finance works really slowly. So things to get actually adoption within the finance world, it it, it really takes time. Um, and it goes with the capital markets as well. So, so um, things like what was interesting, you know, and, and a big opportunity, let's say like 20 years ago, where um, Asian uh, markets were exciting, getting there and, and getting kind of like a global um, equity markets was, was something that took time as well. And every single other example as well in, in finance. So I won't expect kind of like, a, even if there will be high incentives, let's just say that, you know, you will get, let's, let's, let's say some ridiculous number for a DeFi yield. I don't know, like 400% yield or like 
Is that ri ridiculous enough? I think. I think it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's ridiculous. So let's say like we have a, <laughs> we have a market of like DeFi for 400% yield um, for like a year. And I, I do think that brings some institutions, some people into the space. But I would say that's, th th those folks are um, folks that actually come and take the, the arbitrage opportunity. So they, they see that, oh, there's arbitrage. I'm going to come and take the carry trade. Uh, from here. So, so you feel it's the yield, right? The yield is going to drive the transition. I think yield drives the 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 um, kind of like a, the arbitrators of of the traditional finance that realize that something is happening there. You know, there's a free launch. Like you know, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna get that free launch, and there's gonna be turkey on my table. That's basically, I think, that's for arbitrageurs. But the the actual adoption is way more slower. So so let's say that's um, when we think about like more and more like bigger funds, professionalized investments and, and whatnot, it just takes a long time in finance. And, and there's a reason for that because obviously finan financial system is complex, um, but it's also very traditional, but also built in a sense that you have to, you know, you have to compound that reputation and, and success rate. So larger institutions, they necessarily don't want to move if the opportunity exists here for uh, let's say for the next five years, but if this is going to be, you know, revolutionary, if this is going to change the way everyone is going to do finance um, or create markets in the future, obviously that's a more interesting thing, and it just takes more time. So DeFi might be in in the uh, same little bracket even the next uh, five five to eight years, but once it kind of like gets that um, interesting, like a pivotal moment where. It, it, it's getting accepted everywhere. There's clear rules, um, uh, clear, clear um, processes of uh, development, risk management, and everything is just becoming more and more clear and, and uh, familiar. You know, the familiarity is, is very important that we shouldn't um, underestimate. And in that case, uh, after that, let's say five, eight years, you know, DeFi is just going to like take all the waves and it's going to be in, implemented in every place where you know, you have outdated uh, technology. And I think that's totally fine. Like, I personally don't want the whole financial system to change overnight. I think that's a little bit crazy. And I, I think, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of, lot of to build in the space. Like, I don't think DeFi is anywhere near a whole financial system that could be just scaled to everyone. You know, it has, it doesn't have all the necessary tooling. Um, the experience can be better, um, you know, managing funds from like a multi-sig or institutional perspective is, is very nascent still. Um, I think we need that like five to 10 years to, to basically get everything set up so that, that DeFi can actually um, scale. But um, it's gonna be fun because, you know, end of the day, this is gonna, this is gonna change finance forever um, until the next thing will change, <laughs> change DeFi. But I think that's, a, that's the kind of a timeline I'm, I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, makes makes sense. I think there's still some some ways to go, but I think we'll definitely get there over um, over time. What do you think is um, what do you think is is really uh, vital to get more institutions into the space? As a kind of a last question, because your Chainlink is is a in a very interesting position where um, you are providing data sources and quality is, is important. And Real World Asset has an interesting component where you have this on-chain uh, data structure that anyone can audit, but then um, with the proof of reserves, for example, that's a kind of like a tooling for off-chain assets as well and improving those, um, those reserves. So my kind of a last maybe closing question for you is that um, also, I want to know what, what's your favorite drink as well later, but like, before, <laughs> I mean, um, is that what's, uh, what do you think is important that we need in the space to get um, more real world assets and institutions to come? I think at, at the end of the day, your, your instinct about yield to a certain degree is, is right. But I, I think at the same time, when you have a $2 trillion market, that's actually big enough for institutions to want to provide products into. So I think on the one hand, the yield of the DeFi ecosystem will be attractive to a portion of the capital markets. But really, the simple market size 
if that grows from two to three to four to five to 10, that market size in and of itself will be attractive. The big hurdles there will be legal hurdles of how do I legally interface with Aave, how, how do I legally interface with chains, with protocols on public chains. And then there will be a technical hurdle of how do I technically execute transactions? How do I verify the data of the transaction for settlement? How do I connect to this other chain where Aave might be or to another chain where I also have Aave or something, some other set of connections? So I think what we're doing is we're just setting up all of the infrastructure and all of the open source standards for all of that data and all of those connections to happen in anticipation of really, I would say, basically three things. One is that the legal clarity will appear and that there won't be these legal hurdles. The other one is that the, the yield and the value that DeFi provides will continue to be there and, and grow. And then also that the market size of the crypto industry as a whole will continue to grow. Because if it goes from two to three to four to five to 10, at some point it gets so big that even the biggest financial market players can't ignore it. And I think we got on this path in an inevitable way when we went past 200 billion. And so now the question is, how does you know, Aave stay secure while still innovating and providing new markets, new capabilities? How does Chainlink enable infrastructure that allows that to happen, that allows the whole industry to connect better, to get new types of data, to generate new real world assets with that data? And personally, I'm very hopeful because I see you know, smart, thoughtful people like you, like your team, continuing to work the, the problem. And I've been in this industry for a long time and I'm continuing to, to work on the problem. So I think when you have people that are already experienced in these problems, and like your humility about, hey, everything isn't perfect, everything isn't built, everything isn't ready, I think is, is the right point of view because it shows that there's a lot more stuff that needs to, needs to happen. But the fact that you, know, you and me probably a few years ago, like five years ago, if you asked us how close are we to getting this all, all done, you'll be like, oh, it's easy. We just gotta do these five things and it'll be done. And now five plus years later, we're like, man, there's all this stuff to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was way more easier when there was just Ethereum. Right? Yeah, it's, it yeah. was. I kind of like. Um, I, I. That's an interesting uh, discussion because I, I didn't expect the, the scalability to happen uh, the way it's happening today with with mm -hmm. L2s. Uh, um, that was something a little bit later, and and then that also increased the kind of idea of uh, you know we're gonna have these different networks of internets and, um, and 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 that's where you need a lot of. Um, Data. So yeah, I, I've, I think we, we, we're, our lives is way more complex now yeah. than it was five years ago. <laughs> yeah. That's how I feel today. Yeah, absolutely. But I think the opportunity is also there, so it's worth it. Well, Stani, it's really been a pleasure chatting with you. I appreciate all your thoughtful views and candidly sharing with us what the, you know, what the right trajectory is and what the limitations are. It's always you know, my pleasure to speak with you. I always learn a lot. And um, I want to thank you for coming to the event and speaking with me. And uh, excited to be doing even more great things together. So thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks.